All right. Welcome, everybody. Uh, it's Hugo Bowne Anderson here from Out of Bounds. Um, I'm very excited to be here today with Michelle Carney, and we'll be talking about building machine learning products for people um, and the intersection and expansion of the worlds of machine learning and user experience. Um, we'll get started in a few minutes as uh, you'll start rolling in. Um, but if you could introduce yourself in the chat, uh, that would that would be fantastic. It'd be nice to know a bit about, um, you know, who you are, where you're from, what your interest is, um, whether you're working in the field or getting started or studying these things or a well-seasoned veteran of sorts. Um, and that will help us kind of tailor the conversation to um, the types of things you'd like to hear about. So we already already have um, Shady L. Gawili, an ML developer uh, here from the Netherlands. Very welcome. Um, we have OP1 Kenobi. Um, I'm not sure you're from Canada. Be great to know uh, what, what what you're up to and wh what you're interested in. Um, but I'll I'll um, be quiet for a, a couple of minutes and then come back and we'll we'll get started. Hi, everyone. As I just said, for those of you just joining, it's Hugo Bound Anderson here um, uh, from Out of Bounds. Very excited to be chatting with Michelle Carney today about machine learning and, and user experience and how these two worlds can inform one another um, and hopefully help us all to, to build and use uh, more human centric uh, machine learning products um, and thinking about how to build ML products for, for people. Um, if you've got to introduce yourself in the chat, that would be fantastic. Uh, let us know where you're watching from, what you're interested in, in uh, machine learning and, and user experiences. So we have Alberto, um, who's working on a startup to build a data pipeline to augment data for different customers' domains, leveraging ML um, with AWS in, in, in your pipeline. That's great. Um, Julia Workman is a recent UX design grad in the US, interested in breaking into the field of UX research. Uh, Susie is transitioning into tech and interested in machine learning, currently taking a class in UX UI from Scotland. Um, Manoj from India is a consultant, new to this technology and a lifelong learner. Love lifelong learners. I consider myself a, a lifelong learner. Um, software engineer um, from a uh, bank, Michael Inyang from, from Nigeria. This is, this is fantastic. We have a wide array of, of different people um, across different continents um, and also very interested in different things. Um, Nate ML. Um, I, I, I think that's your handle. If you're, if you're, if your first name is Nate ML, I'd be incredibly impressed. But, um, Nate ML is an ML product manager from Canada. Um, and is curious on, uh, Michelle and our approaches to finding, finding solutions. Um, this is great. I actually think, um, the field of ML product management more generally is something that we should definitively talk more about. Um, we have Kathleen, who's from Canada, working as a UX associate for an ML company. Um, we have an economist. Um, we have someone uh, making a career change, looking to break into data science, including the potential to go into machine learning. Um, so this is all, all incredibly fascinating um, and, and wonderful things um, that I'm, I'm really excited to have you all here for. So in all honesty, um, I think, Without without further ado, I'm I'm so excited. I'd uh, I, I'd like to get started. So um, Michelle, if you're there and could share your video, and I'll do do the same. I'm trying to interact with Zoom while interacting with YouTube. So there we go. Stop share. I can see you. You look great. And what what is that background you have there, Michelle? Oh my gosh, thank you for asking. Uh, hi, I'm Michelle. I am the founder and organizer of the MLUX Meetup, and this is our branding. It is all virtual, it is all AI, which is why my hand keeps on getting cut off, I guess, when I go of right. Of course. Uh, yeah. Good morning, everyone. So nice to meet you, and so glad to hear that there are folks from all around the world. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much. And this is, it's a great turnout from around the world. I did, I did one online chat once where we had someone tuning in from Antarctica. Um, and so we'll see if we get, you know, that 
that continent. And I can't, like, they, like, I've actually been to Antarctica and the, the, even checking your email is relatively expensive because of getting, you know, sat satellite technology down there. So I don't know what, what streaming is like. Um, but enough about all, all the continents. Um, look, Michelle, it's so exciting to have you here. Um, and I, I think people will have looked at the, the event description and know a, a bit about you, but I thought I'd give you an intro, talk a bit about what we do, and then, then we can jump in. Um, Perfect. Sounds great. And if I say anything that's in incorrect, um, I'll definitely let you know. correct. Yeah, please. Yeah. Um, so, everybody, um, as you know, I'm Hugo from Out of Bounds. Michelle is a computational uh, neuroscientist turned UX researcher whose practice focuses on the intersection of machine learning and UX. Um, she's a lecturer at Stanford D School. She's a founder of the ML UX Meetup, which if you're interested in these types of things, I definitely encourage you to check them out and become part of this wonderful and growing community. And I'll put some links in the YouTube uh, chat as well. Um, Michelle is also currently a senior UX researcher on Google's TensorFlow team, um, where her projects focus on combining machine learning and UX. Um, about me and uh, about us, I my, my background's in, in, in basic scientific research uh, in cell biology, uh, biophysics, uh, and, and math, and applied math. Um, and when I was working in basic research, um, I saw some of the most brilliant scientists I'd, I'd ever met um, not have access to the tools and the wisdom layers around those tools uh, that they needed in order to uh, do, do the work, in, in order to do science. So I'm very interested in lowering, the, lowering all the barriers to entry and all the friction, helping scientists do better science by building tools um, and working on collect collective wisdom around uh, scientific tooling. Um, so that's kind of why I'm at Out of Bounds, where we're working on infrastructure and productivity tools for data scientists to allow them to focus on building models and actually doing science while having easy access to infrastructural layers and not having to worry about, well, with my tongue in my cheek, configuration files and um, cl cluster configurations and that type of stuff. Um, we're doing mo this mostly through the open source framework Metaflow at the moment, but we're very excited to also be working on, on, on products. Um, if you're interested in this type of thing, um, the obligatory, please hit subscribe and share with friends if uh, you think it will interest them. Um, we're also going to have uh, an async AMA with Michelle and myself for a week or so afterwards where um, I'll share the link in Slack, uh, sorry, the link to the Slack AMA in uh, YouTube chat. Um, and if you're interested, come and ask questions. And then over the next week, we'll pop in every now and then and um, answer them. So yeah, I just joined, so I'm on it. Yeah, exactly. Um, and so, Michelle, I think I'd love to hear more, more about you and perhaps kind of framing it around how you got into the data and UX worlds. I think that would be a very interesting story to kind of set the scene for what we're talking about today. Totally. Thank you for that kind intro, Hugo, and so stoked uh, to be here today. So I also just want to acknowledge uh, all the people who are on the line who are like, I'm thinking about career shifting. Totally. I have been there. Hugo has been there. Actually, that was one of the things that uh, we uh, started chatting about. Oh, wait, am I frozen? Okay, no. no just you're good. Yep. Um, is that both of us came from like computational biology backgrounds and then we mm. found our way into tech. And so you're doing the right thing by showing up and asking questions. And so welcome. We're so excited that you're here. And um, we also I both were very interested in the IPython notebook a yes. decade ago as well, which yes. is one of our first points of connection when you were at Berkeley. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. So my backstory is that I studied in my undergrad computational neuroscience. Um, at the time, would I call myself a data scientist or machine learning engineer? No, I would call myself like a undergrad researcher, but I was, you know, converting MATLAB notebooks into, at the time, IPython notebooks when they were first being uh, created. Uh, which is now Jupyter Notebooks. Uh, so Hugo and I definitely bonded over like, oh, I remember the good old days. And if you download a Jupyter Notebook now, it's uh, IPYMB. Um, so anyways, that's IPython Notebook. Hey, what's up? And it was like, you know, an amazing tool at the time to like help communicate, like how does this specific part of code actually, uh, uh, what does it actually do? How do you debug it? And now look how far we've come in just 10 years. Um, but a lot of what I was doing, a lot of my research projects were around 
uh, like hearing aid algorithms and like signal noise processing. And what I found is just because you can optimize like a model and you're running the model on your test data and it's showing like, oh, this model's 30% better than like the prior one. Uh, you go and give it to people who where that's where it actually matters, right? Uh, they're going to be the ones who are going to hear the difference and they actually didn't hear a difference. And so um, that's what got me really interested in like, wait, hold on, numbers are not objective. Like we really have to think about uh, like how is the subjective experience? What does this, like a lot of our ML stuff ends up for people. And so how do people perceive it? How do we make ML products? I now post hoc, I'm like, oh yeah, I was a data engineer and a data scientist and I was doing ML engineering at the time. None of that stuff really was like key terms or anything. I think it was like big data was what it was all called mm -hmm. uh, at that time. Um, so did my time doing uh, that for about five years, uh, got my first job in innovation UX. And so I was working a lot on like, hey, how do we you know, design the future of payments and all this stuff too, it was very cool, but I was missing the data science side. So I went back to grad school at UC Berkeley where I got my master's in information management and systems at the UC Berkeley School of Information. So if anyone's looking for career shifts, I would also recommend iSchools. I think they are awesome. Uh, I schools being the school of information, not optometry schools. Um, they're really great, super interdisciplinary. And there, that's where I made sure that I focused on in these two years, I want to come out as like as a ML UXer or whatever that kind of looks like. I think at the time I was calling it data science and design because I was like, they both start with D or whatever. And then everyone's like, that's really confusing. So ML and UX, those are the two things. I will say I did have a lot of trouble because you know, I had been building out neural networks. I had been building out these ML models. Now I was interested in the UX side of it. And um, I feel like the industry just in general wasn't quite ready. So I would come in to like job interviews and stuff and they'd be like, if you do both ML and UX, you must not be good at either. And I'm mm. like, wait, what? No, I love both and I do both very well. Um, so really getting my master's in that was a way to kind of like solidify that. And during that process, I made the ML UX meetup and that's where I got funding for it through my grad program and everything too. Um, so I, I made it really as like a beacon and like a light for other people who are are like, hey, I'm interested in like making ML models more usable. Uh, and so we've been going for about five years, uh, all free. Uh, any donations go back to our larger nonprofit at Feminist AI. Um, and yeah, I think the rest is history. After grad school, I convinced enough people to let me do ML products. And so I've been an embedded UXer on ML teams for the last uh, couple years, um, including things like basically uh, sitting down with the ML researchers and being like, cool, cool, love this model. Who is it for? How do we make sure that this is solving a real user need? And so I do some prototyping around ML. I do some user research around like, what are ways that this is gonna solve their problem? Like giving them access to early prototypes and everything too, but also foundational research and everything in between. So um, that's kind of my specialty as a ML UXer. Beautiful. Thank you for that rich and, and thoughtful and shifting history. I, I, I do think we do live in an age of um, more career shifts. And I think we, unlike my grandfather, who, you know, was a chartered accountant his, his entire life, right? Um, where it's almost necessary, especially with the evolving skill sets and technologies we have that perhaps will be shift, shifting around. So I, for one, as people may know and kind of mentioned before, have moved from basic research in pure math, then applied math, then biophysics, yeah. then physics, to um, to industry data science, to to DevRel and evangelism, and, and, and these type and community building. And I think the community building aspect is something you and I have, have a lot in common about uh, as well. And I do I put the links that um, to a lot of things you work on, including the meetup. But I do I just want to give one more pitch for, for your meetup. I think we've done it pretty well so far. But you've one of the links is a Google Doc which to give people a bit more context, it's a group of over 3,000 data scientists, UX designers, researchers, and tech professionals who gather regularly for technical talks to learn about this intersection. What, what I find interesting in this document though, as well, which the, the analysis is a few years old, so give or take, but 50% of people in this group, uh, product UX, design research, 33% machine learning, data scientists, uh, analysts, then you have um, uh, product managers, software developers, a lot of other different types of people. Everyone so, in between, co-founders, they exactly. do everything. Exactly. Um, so yeah. this type of interdisciplinary space, I think is, is incredible. 
Totally. Um, Thank you for that pitch. Yes. Um, absolutely. I think I get a little shy about it because it's kind of like, hey, my garage band is playing down at the, like the local bar. And like, totally. actually, wait, hold on. We have like a bunch of members and yeah, and it's all free. That's the other really amazing thing is that I got a fellowship through grad school to, you know, do the initial kickoff. And we started with like what I thought was going to be like a 30 person pizza party once a quarter. And our second event had 200 people at Autodesk. You know, it's like, mm. insane. It, it, like, it just was so validating to me to see other people interested in this because I was getting shut down about, hey, wait, how do we make ML more usable? And people were like, no, no, no. Those are two separate teams. Yeah. Um, so yeah, and if you're interested too, we also write up all of our articles on Medium. Uh, mm -hmm. So we have amazing volunteers who actually take the time to kind of synthesize the highlights and put it up uh, and run format on Medium. We also upload all of our videos on YouTube. So we have a YouTube channel and stuff too. <laughs> so I guess if you're already on YouTube and you're live streaming this, Hello, navigate over to our channel. Do not um, leave this live stream though. Oh yeah, yeah. don't leave this live. Yeah. Oh, duplicate tab and then like, it'll show two of you on the live stream then you're gonna get an echo, it's gonna be great. Uh, just kidding. Um, yeah, probably our best place is Twitter. Um, and just some like highlighting some, some topics that we just recently did maybe. Um, in June, we did an event uh, with the AI Test Kitchen which is from Google AI around how do you test out early AI um, like and get user feedback real time. Uh, we also did an event with um, the month before with Expedia's head of uh, data science lead and a UX design lead on personalization UX. Mm -hmm. uh, we've done events before with the Microsoft Hacks Toolkit uh, team. So their human AI experiences toolkit. And so how what are design best practices around designing ML? Uh, the Pair team is another one of my favorites over at Google around how does Google Photos really think about uh, making personalized experiences. Anyways, this is all to say, if you like this stuff, go check out our YouTube, go check out our Medium, come join us. It's free. We're cool. Hey, what's up? Yeah. What's up? Awesome. <laughs> um, I've just seen people in the chat are saying um, they're getting 404 errors with the links. I understand now why that's happening. It's because of how YouTube has rendered them. In, I'm not passing I'm not passing the buck to, to YouTube here, but when I pasted them, the links are actually correct, but the spacing is incorrect because yeah. Michelle and I are talking now. I, I don't have the multitasking ability to go and re-edit totally. them but i will provide them in slack after the fact if somebody wants to go and do it in in, in real time in youtube oh, i put it in slack i put it under ama guests oh so, great so yeah if, add, go join the ama guest slack and then fantastic <laughs> if you join the slack uh link i provided up the top and join the ama guest slack channel um uh you'll you'll get all get all of them okay um yeah. so I, I i apologize for that but um, come come and say hi on on, on Thank Slack. you for saying something, people on the line. Yeah. I also can't see, so thank you, Hugo, for yeah. this is why you were so quiet and you looked very serious. I'm like, oh, I don't know what's happening. <laughs> oh, and o OP One Kenobi is um going to provide the co correct links in, in a thank second. Thank you. Um, and and Zahid Jaffa has said um they do not have Slack. Are there any alternatives? Um, when the links are provided here, that they are. Um, but I'm I'm not a shill for Slack, but if you want to join our community and talk about these types of things, Slack is where, where we do it. Um, and you don't actually need to install it. You can use it in the browser as well, but I'm, I'm not going to pr promote Slack in, any further, but that's where we do our, our community efforts currently as well as on, uh, on YouTube. Um, totally. yeah. Also, if you look up, I think at the bottom of any of our uh, MLUX medium articles. So if you go to bit.ly slash what is MLUX at the bottom should also have all those links there. Um, awesome. That's kind of like my general, like, why do we exist? What's going on? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So let's let's jump in. We're here to talk about UX for ML products, among other things. So um, could we set the scene by even saying what is a machine learning product and what types are we actually going to talk about today? Are you interested in? Totally. Um, and I also want to acknowledge too, like I am speaking as the founder of this MLUX meetup. Uh, basically, I have like five years of aggregating really interesting talks from really interesting companies that are mm. public. And so I'm kind of sharing like a bunch of different resources and smatterings of uh, all these different teams and everything too. But when I think about ML and UX and really ML products and doing UX for ML products, the biggest thing that I think about is that like, kind of a couple years ago, like ML itself was kind of like a part of the product. I'm thinking like the Spotify Discover Weekly. Mm -hmm. um, like it was like there, the rest of it was more or less editorial or like you could kind of understand how it got there. And then it's like, here's the ML part. But now increasingly we're seeing ML 
be the experience itself. ML is like the product. And so along with that, we have to think about what are all the design considerations. So the biggest thing that I tell teams is also your ML product does not exist in a vacuum. And so what are all the different things your users are doing? Um, how are they getting there? What are they gonna do with like, say it's a recommender system? How are they gonna get the feedback and everything as well? You really need to be thinking about um, you know, what is the problem for the user that this is solving? Is it trained on the right data? A lot of the times we use proxy data and everything too. And then we're like, oh, but it could solve this problem. But like, what are the edge cases? When doesn't it solve that problem? How is the user gonna get feedback? Um, all that kind of stuff. So uh, yeah, it really is like the more ML things that we make and we wanna get it out in the world, mm -hmm. they become the products themselves. And so we have to think about them as products that need to be designed. So in that sense, we're thinking about, you know, some of the ones that we probably all know about, such as Rexis, re recommender systems, um, mm -hmm. search, maybe, um, you know, apps that we use, whether we're using Uber or something like that. Are we also thinking about in internal products used in company like that data scientists and machine learning people will use in internally, right? In I am also thinking about like forecasting stuff and everything yeah. too, like becoming really easy for lead I mean, scoring models for sales teams in organizations. I was just thinking about sales teams where it's yeah. like, yeah, we could do drag and drop for sales teams and everything too, but how do we make sure that they understand what those insights are and everything mm. too? Like the yeah. one example that I always give, and I give this in the class. Oh yeah. Hey, I also teach, uh, this is my, going to be my fifth year teaching at Stanford uh, School of Design. I teach on designing machine learning. Mm. One example that I give is Typically, as a data scientist, I might drop all null values because null values can't be read by a machine learning mm -hmm. algorithm. So I might just be like, oh, let's just ignore those for right now and get a model up and running. Um, but what if the null values are actually people's zip codes and we just excluded an entire group of people? Mm -hmm. So like now think about a sales team and let's say we automate all of this away with ML. And so we are now like, oh, clean up any of the data. Like we automate the ML of the cleaning of the data where it's like drop anything that you know is missing values or something and then run a forecasting model on that oh my gosh you could be missing an entire population of people like things like mm. that too like how do we design our tools to make it very clear and transparent to the end users what is happening and how they can understand under the hood without needing to have a phd in applied math or something so yeah yeah and so i think we've hinted towards an answer to the following question but i, I want to be kind of more explicit I, I suppose a lot of people here are already motivated um, to think about these things, but what, why should we care? I mean, why do data scientists and people doing machine learning really need to start thinking about more about UX and why is this becoming more important and gonna become even, even more important? Totally love that question. Um, okay, so I think Victoria from the Expedia team, she's like a lead data scientist there, said it best of like, I can work with my designers to actually get better data for future models that then we can build and improve and correct over time. And I think mm. for personalization, it makes it very clear because I think all of us, I mean, if you're on YouTube, you've experienced personalization this morning, right? <laughs> and so like, we all kind of have that experience in that way, but also UX designers, um, and if there's any UX designers on the line too, who are like, ah, oh, I don't, I didn't study machine learning data science totally, but you are an expert in your craft. And so think about how this is another material that needs to be designed and really thought about, about like, how are users going to engage with this? What's going to happen when it's wrong? Machine learning is probabilistic. So there will always be times when it's wrong. So how do you design for that failure? How do you design, um, to meet your users' mental models? Like that's another thing too, is sometimes when we're ML researchers, we make these really cool models and we're like, oh, and it'll just work like this. But then you hand out over the fence to another team who makes it and all this stuff too. And it doesn't quite exactly fit that mold. So it's really important to work with a uh, user experience team to really think about hey, what is the entire ecosystem in which this model exists? Like, mm. how do they get to this recommendation or this model? Uh, how are they going to, what is the decision they're going to make after this model and everything too, right? In recommendations, it's very easy. It's like, oh, wait, maybe they were interested in discovering new music. They click this thing, they listen to the music. But for the sales forecasting stuff or the enterprise tooling, right? Maybe it's something like, hey, I am interested in understanding my last quarter of sales. I'm going to run this model. And like, what is the decision I make after that? So... Anyways, that's work with your UX teams. They think about uh, your users, so. Well, and this is so okay. I was actually speaking with a friend of mine who, um, she runs uh, machine learning um, engineering at T-Mobile. And she she does a lot of conversational AI, chat, customer service chatbots, that type of stuff. Oh. And something that she sees time and time again is no matter 
no matter what you think people are going to write or people are going to do. They do the, they do the type, all types of things straight away that you've never thought of, right? So it's so important to have insight into how your users will actually behave, right? And this occurs all across the board. Totally. Oh, love that you brought up chatbots. Uh, yeah, chatbots are another really big one. We have a ton of past MLUX uh, talks on chatbots too, if anyone on the line is super interested. But yes, it's like how, um, imagine too, like you uh, have a chatbot that will be like, hi, I'm you go, uh, I'm here to help. Like, and I'm trying to return my package. I'm like, hi, you go. So great to see you. Like, oh my gosh, I'm trying to return my package today. And then it says, you can say return package or, and I'm like, why did you present yourself as a person? If I, mm. if all you are is a bot and like, then I would have talked to you like a bot. I wouldn't, maybe this is my bad because I used to do UX research on optimizing call centers. And so I'm like always very nice to people who are in call centers or chatbot centers. So I'm like talking to them as if they are like having a hard day and no, really it's just a bot the entire time. So by presenting that your bot is a chatbot, um, that can really help your user's mental model about what can I actually do with this? Yeah. How can I engage with this? And then on top of it, like you're mentioning, users will, if you have an open-ended text field, users will just say everything. On the flip side, I'm sure some of us have dealt with customer service chatbots, which have only like on WhatsApp and stuff where they only have the buttons. And mm. you're like, oh, my thing isn't there. I need to type it in. And so it's like, well, what's the medium? What's the in-between? And how do you work with a uh, chatbot or voice user interface designer to kind of meet that expectation. Um, and like, when should a human get involved? That's another thing too, is like, uh, so yeah, when much, you pass it off. yeah, exactly. Like these ML products, so much of the time it, for our users, it just feels like AI is just something that happens to me. And like, I just have to like deal with the consequences or like deal with how to engage with it. But mm. what if we were to flip the paradigm and actually be like, Hey, how do users have control over the situation and like help solve their problem rather than our AI is so smart and everything too, right? Yeah. <laughs> There's a lot of over-indexing, I think, on, you know, the field of artificial intelligence is actually modeling human intelligence in a lot of ways, but like humans do a lot of things innately and everything too. Why are we modeling it after people when actually you could just make a very good, like, I am a robot. This is what I'm made to do. Absolutely. And, like it reach their, reaches their task really fast. So. Yeah. This is why I have one of several reasons why I have no interest in the, the Turing test. I have some maybe intellectual, religious interest in the Turing test, um, but I, 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 I definitely agree with that. And actually harnessing other types of intelligence. Um, Michael Jordan from Berkeley has a wonderful essay called The Artificial Intelligence Revolution Hasn't Started Yet in the Harvard Data Science Review, where he's like, why are we doing hand labeling stuff to try to replicate that form of intelligence, which isn't really that smart, to, to be honest. Why aren't we trying to harness the intelligence of um, ecosystems such as markets. Stephen Wolfram talks about the intelligence of clouds as information yeah. processing um, s systems, right? So there are, and I, I suppose the point is we don't necessarily have uh, good def working definitions of what intelligence actually is. The other thing that came to mind when thinking about a wide array of users is who are our users, right? Um, originally, Twitter had uh, a maximum character length for your name, right? Which worked somewhat for the type of people that ran Twitter. But as soon as India started adopting Twitter, where they have a lot longer names, suddenly yeah. it's like, oh, I can't even put my name there. I've had this issue in the US when I get routed to a call center where I have to say things. I'm not gonna do my horrible American accent, but I have one in order to interact with, ah. with certain like voice call systems, like yeah. the IRS. Of course, I've got other problems with trying to telephone the IRS, but you know, who are our actual users? And I think UX can de definitively, you know, help to inform us about, about this as well. And who are we serving, right? Totally. And so that's another reason too, of like, we can make all the golden paths of this ML product. Like, let's just say you as an ML team make like this really cool product. It works for your entire team. You're like, awesome like you mentioned, there are always going to be people who are using it in ways that you aren't expecting. So this mm. is why UX research becomes, this is more of what I do, testing it with large amounts of different people in different ways. Um, thinking about like, hey, how do I give people maybe an early access? So that way I could see how they are trying to use it. And there's so many methods on that. Actually, there's a really good tool that I love Cold scale. I'm going to ping this to you maybe. Right. Uh, this is a article that I wrote um, for them about how I use their tool um, in C2 to really capture like people's feedback as they're using novel ML products and like 
um, basically TLDR, people are already solving this problem in a certain way. Mm. No matter what, <laughs> whenever your ML comes in, even if it's doing something new, but like you're talking about like, you know, call centers or something like that too, they've already been solving this. Your ML is coming into this mental model of theirs of like, hey, wait, they're just trying to like get in contact with a person or, you know, change their address or something. And so how do you make sure that they can still complete their task? How do you measure how well your product doing uh, compared to the current process and everything like that? So that's a lot of uh, what I also do. So I, um, too. Uh, I, I want you to stop telling me about all the things. I'm like, I need to get out of the game now. Michelle does so many amazing, amazing things. Um, but okay, so I'm going to break my, my golden rule of these conversations, which is only ask one question at once. Um, my question, my initial question was, um, what type of things to data scientists need to know about UX? But we also, I'm so happy that we have a lot of people from the UX world on, on, on the call. So I'd love to know what it would help UX people to know about data science as well. So we can talk about those two things together or separately, um, whatever you think is probably the, the best introduction to this, this type of space. A thousand percent. Okay. Um, I mean, for UX people, as well as all the career shifting people out there, um, I am well aware that data science and machine learning and AI can feel a little bit... Um, uh, Overwhelming? Yes, overwhelming, exclusionary. Uh, for like, people, I work in machine learning. I know, it feels I know, like I know. that like, for me as well. No, I'm, I'm okay. Right? Yeah, yeah. Totally, for I mean, us who work in it, it feels yeah. like that. Yes, and it's like I, what I see is really talented people who go into machine learning and they're like, oh, this is really scary, and everyone's way smarter than me, and I don't have my PhD, and I can't do this. And so, um, my biggest thing is that you are an expert in something. Whether you are a career shifter, you're a teacher by day and you're interested in getting in data science, you are an expert in teaching. You're an expert mm. in interacting in like classroom management, whatever you want to call it, lesson planning. It's great. Like, um, or, you know, as a UX person, you have probably done a lot of these like enterprise tooling flows or like product design and product launches. You're an expert in that. And so um, thinking of machine learning as a, uh, just another application of this, of like a way that you can apply your skills and show up and make a difference, I think is really big. The other thing is finding teams that appreciate and respect your background is another big thing because that's mm. how you're going to have the impact. Um, and for that, data science teams, I strongly recommend uh, thinking about like, hey, wait, hold on. If we do things as we've always done, we'll get what we've always got. So like, how do I work with my UX team more to really think about, hey, it, like, literally break it down and show them like this is my collab notebook or my jupyter notebook and like when i put this type of input you can imagine this is like a sensor in your smart home or something this is the type of output that comes out what are some other ways that users might want to use this no. um because when you invite more people to the table when things are designed by everyone they are for everyone um and we're moving into a era of like ai machine learning where it's really easy and approachable to do ml now i mean a lot more than it was like Hugo, when you and I did it, I mean, you were an applied mathematician. Like I was just an undergrad being like, hey, look, this eigenvector, cool, 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 transformations, optimize. Um, but like, it is really so much easier to get models off the shelf and see what they can do and try them out in new ways. Um, and so that's the kind of thing that I want to encourage teams to think about is like, okay, well, we don't need to do things like business as usual. If we want to make a product that's people are going to love and going to use, how do we really think about like what the user needs are? And then how can this be an ML thing? To solve? Spoiler alert, I'm also going to say this too. Sometimes it doesn't need to be ML. Like that's mm. another thing. Oh, uh, also... beautiful. Um, this is one of the things that I see a ton. Actually, I saw a public talk by the Gmail team a couple years ago, and I absolutely love this example. I'm sure all of us have experienced this where you type in like, okay, see attachment below. And then you hit send and it says, did you mean to send an attachment? Cause you don't have it there. Yep. So they actually ran this with, they made a regex version, which is basically like a bunch of rules based NLP stuff. And then they made like an ML version, which was trained on like, here's all these emails that meant to have attachments and didn't and all the ones that did and all this mm. other stuff. The regex version, which just was rules actually performed like way better than the ML version. So even though they Absolutely. went through all this trouble of like collecting the data and all this stuff too, sometimes you just need to be like, 
anytime someone says sees below or see attached or say attachment, just double check. Is there an attachment before you send it? So anyways. Uh, I, and I love that example it also because it also speaks to um, when we think about how sophisticated our technology is, I always joke we still use regular expressions, which is a, a wonderful tool, but a, a barbaric tool. In, in so regular ways. expressions, by the way, for uh, folks on the line is regex. It's the same thing. Yep. It's like basically defining what you mean and stuff for the computer. Yep. Yeah, exactly. And so you can say, I want certain symbols in a particular order. Maybe they're uppercase, maybe they're lowercase. Kind of, it's pattern pattern matching, not yeah. using machine learning. Um, yeah. I will not put the following link into the chat because this is a horrible website, but there's a website called uh, regex crosswords where you can do reg regular expression crosswords. Do not John. look it up now because it will, it will send you into a, into a tailspin. I've, I've lost, I've, I've lost friends over over, <laughs> over these crosswords. Um, I've nearly lost jobs. Um, so I um oh thank you for this, Hugo. Uh this is you have now made my weekend. Now you know yeah. what I'm gonna be doing this weekend. Ab absolutely, weekend. yeah. So yeah. I but please I'll I'll make sure you come and answer some questions on on, on Slack <laughs> as well. <laughs> I'll, so you don't get I'll too check stuck. in there in between the um, crosswords. Uh -huh. We have a have a wonderful comment from Scott DeWitt in, in, in the chat when talking about uh, you know needing to know more more about users that and particularly with ml that there's an irony that in a lot of ml that critical domain expertise is either un unvalued or, or or undervalued yes a thousand percent um especially like you know this idea of like a soft science of qualitative interviews and the hard science of like numbers and machine learning what i like to say is that um, quantitative work tells you what's happening, but it doesn't tell you why it's happening. And mm. so if you really want to understand why it's happening, you have to go and talk to people. And it's not just like, okay, how much do you love my product? Do you love it a lot, a ton or a bajillion ton? Like, yep. right. That is not talking to people and understanding what they need. I'm talking like contextual inquiries, people who might have their PhD in sociology, like some of the best ethnography researchers are people who literally studied ethnography. Yeah. Um, and like understanding like what is the context in which you're trying to use this model and everything too um what we need is more advocates in the field uh like was it scott yep yeah scott stand up for that this is an important thing because the other thing is you're gonna see a huge uh like roi or return on investment when you start including those voices they can do um found like i do a lot of foundational research even though i I come from the more machine learning data science background and I'm not an ethnographer, but it's just because that I have to understand like, wait, how are people currently solving this problem? What are they currently trying to use? And how do we make sure that our ML offering or our ML product actually solves that problem? And you could see a bunch of examples of this too from our, our medium and all that stuff as well. I'm thinking specifically the LinkedIn case studies and everything too. They actually mm -hmm. outlined, uh, we had the head of UX research for LinkedIn's recommendation team come in and speak uh on whatever last year it's on our ml ux medium channel and they basically were like listen all these ml teams were like solving this in different ways and we came in and we helped them really prioritize what they need to solve we helped them yeah. actually communicate what this algorithm's recommending and all this stuff too so absolutely fantastic and so we've actually got several interesting questions in the chat now that i hope to get to but i've got things that that i really want to ask you first if we don't get to your question please come into the, the the Slack group and we can we can chat about it uh, async uh, after the fact uh, as well. But some of the questions that I, I want to get to kind of talk, talk around your points as well. Um, I'd like to know some some concrete things, Michelle, of the top three to five things, for example, that data professionals and people in machine learning should know about UX design. Oh, top, top things. Um, UX design is much more than pretty pixels. Uh, I would say I do UX, but if you want me to design your slides, they're going to be in black and white. Well, sorry, like mm. I don't come from a visual design background, right? Yep. I think like you, UX is short for user experience. And so think about mm. the overall experience. The other thing is there's so many other types of things besides UX design. So UX design might be like literally like what is the flow of the page and like how do you make sure that all the relevant stuff is there but like what i do is ux research which is really understanding what is the user's experience and like how do they currently solve this problem and how might they want to use this product let's now evaluate the product with them more of that usability testing um so one 
uh, UX is more than just visual design. Uh, two, um, UX designers can also really help you think about things in brand new ways that you've never considered. And so that's mm. another thing too is like, I know when I, so I kind of like switch off between being a data scientist or ML researcher and then being a UX researcher. Um, but when I get into my ML researcher mode where I'm like making ML stuff, like I did a, a or I've done a bunch of like AI art kind of things and everything too, and every, uh, like in collab, anyways, it's up on medium somewhere. Um, but like when I'm in that mindset, I'm just like, oh wait, what if I do this? And what if I optimize this? And what if I change this variable? And like, oh, what, how does this hyperparameter change? Like, you know, this style transfer or something mm. like that. When I have a, like a design friend then come in be like, oh, actually I really liked this part of it. it like the, you're seeing the whole picture. And like, that's really helpful for me when I'm like in that mode of like doing ML based things. Um, because sometimes we get so focused on like, what is it that the technology can do that we stop thinking about like, what should the technology do? Yeah. If that makes sense. Cause you start Absolutely. like, I don't do a ton of computer vision, um, but I do more NLP. So like mm. in NLP, I might be like, well, I know that if I could do bigrams and trigrams, like a way of like parsing like um, text and everything too, or like entity recognition, I typically do it this way. But actually if I really have someone thinking about like critically around what are we trying to solve here? It really helps me think more holistically about what I'm doing. Ab absolutely. And I, because I partially work in marketing as well, I do, yeah. there, there's kind of a misalignment of incentives. Like if you use like a, an LSTM or some, you know, transformer or something like that, but a regex actually does a, a better job or as good a job, but you want to market it to, to the world, like perhaps you'll be incentivized to use a tool which you don't even necessarily need. Yeah, totally. And so um, that is definitely another one too. I love that we already talked about uh, sometimes you don't need ML. That is definitely a valid point. Uh, but there are times when you very much need ML. And that is also when I think UX can come in and help identify those moments. Because mm. if you are bringing your UX team along about like, hey, here are all the different options. And like, this is these are the trade-offs and everything too. Let's understand with our users which one should we go with? Why should we do yep. it? How do we present it? How do we design to get feedback? That's another really big one too. Um, so part of it is, I also love that both of us come from teaching, uh, teaching computational stuff. We mm. have a lot of people on the line, it sounds like might coming from different disciplines and backgrounds. Tap into that teaching mode, be like, I need you to understand this so that way you can help think critically about this and give me feedback about what the future of this should be. Um, so. Yeah. I, I couldn't agree more. And we mentioned before that someone in, in the chat said they're here for many reasons, including being a lifelong learner. Um, some of the people I found most in, in, engaging in, in my life, life are lifelong learners and lifelong teachers. And there's some iterative approach to knowledge and, and, and wisdom development and experimentation. Oh. And um, this yeah. is something else I wanted to mention is, um, you know, even though you might learn you know, Python or R or some type of data science, new things are constantly coming out. And this is something that I am always telling my students and always telling people who are in like career transitions and stuff too. In this field, you have to be a lifelong learner because mm. there's always new libraries, there's always new things. And so I uh, love it, be curious, stay curious, understand maybe like, wait, hold on, why is this library better than this library? Like yep. what are the trade-offs and everything like that too, so. Exactly. Although the one thing we can't seem to shake is SQL for whatever reason. <laughs> It just keeps keeps com coming back. We thought we thought we'd seen the last of it, and bam, straight yeah. straight straight back in there. Um, so true. I am interested in. Um, we've talked about how UX can help us think about machine learning products. Um, I know you're also interested in how machine learning and data science can help us think about UX. So maybe you can tell us a few things about about that. Totally. Um, so there is a field in UX called quantitative UX research, um, which this is typically where it would then fall. This is one of my favorite fields. Um, it is something that I end up falling into a lot. And so if there's any data scientists on the line too, who are like, man, I like data science, but I am tired of just crunching numbers or like, you know, making models around forecasting and stuff too. Mm. I really want to Think about people. Quant UX research is the field for you. Um, and so when I, some of my favorite projects or some of my favorite ways that machine learning and data science can be used for UX are things like data-driven personas. So 
Salesforce actually gave us a really awesome talk on this uh, a couple years ago. Um, but let's say you have a bunch of UI click metric data of like all the times users have clicked through your product and everything too. Like you have a travel site and you have like all their back buttons and like when they actually booked and when they didn't book and everything yep. like that. You can then use unsupervised learning methods like K-nearest neighbors and principal components analysis to find the trends in that user like flow and that user pattern mm -hmm. and understand like, hey, what are some like ways that people are currently trying to solve things? What are like, for instance, for maybe uh, there's a lot of um, people who spend a ton of time searching for flights but don't actually book anything maybe they are like oh i'm like the hypothetical traveler i would love to travel but i don't actually book it or things like that too or maybe there's like oh you know one and done like i want to click through i just want the cheapest flight and that's it um so it's really interesting things like that that you can find in trends and patterns through your data but then you get to the voiceover the insights by then finding someone near that centroid of or the center of that you know, persona and the following mm. up with them and being like, hey, can I interview you? And can I talk to you about how you typically book travel or something like that too? And so, um, or, you know, finding similar types of behaviors uh, and then interviewing them and understanding what is their mental model. So then you understand a cluster of users who are kind of doing that thing. Awesome. And in all honesty, I love cool applications of unsupervised learning as well. We talk and work yeah. far too much in supervised learning. Um, so that's that's really really nice to hear. I mean, I feel like there's there's a time and a place for unsupervised learning, and this is definitely one of them, where you're letting mm. the data trends speak for themselves, mm. and then you're coupling that. This is the important part: is couple it with qualitative interviews, because otherwise, remember, it just tells you what's happening. Like, oh, there's a bunch of people who immediately go and book a flight. There's a bunch of people who, you know, explore around and never book anything. But it's once you talk to them and you understand, oh, wait, this is kind of like the mental model that they're thinking of. They're like the, I want to explore a lot of places person or whatever. Absolutely. And I do think supervised learning is incredibly powerful and important. But yes. as soon as we start assigning labels immediately to things and we're performing classification, what are we losing there? What projections are happening that we're not forgetting about? And I don't want to get too postmodern, but what type of power, who, who decides what yeah. the classification is? Do we want the board of Twitter to decide how to classify global Twitter users. I, I don't know why I'm choosing Twitter several times. Um, do we want the CEO of Tesla to, you know, whatever, who doesn't own Twitter, right? Um, funnily enough. Um, yeah, that, I would say one more thing that I would give an example of is um, my favorite is also things like word to vec and everything. Mm. So word to vec is basically a way that you can change, like analyze a large corpus of text and then mm. find and do math on the words. So vectorizing them yep. uh, in like very simple terms. There's so putting like, them in like some form of multi-dimensional yeah. space, like with oh. directions, right? And so the, the famous like, example, which we didn't, I mean, which is gendered and I, I, I apologize for that, but one of the first examples that when you do these types of embeddings, you see something like king minus queen is actually the same vector as man minus woman. So, yeah. That, and I think one of the points there is that gender is embedded in language. That's one takeaway there. Totally. And it can be mathematized. Um, but that, that's an interesting result, right? I just posted in Slack one of my favorite um, visualizations of this too. And so oh, if you awesome. want to play around with it, it's like a word cloud and all this stuff too. But instead of doing this, like using the regular pre-trained word to back, what if you were to train your own word to back, but on user comments or things like that too, about like, let's go with the travel example. We want user recommendations on like beach travel and all of a sudden, uh, you know, Playa ends up coming up a ton and you didn't put that in your regex or anything too, but it like, oh, these words should co-occur together. And so when we search for beach, I should also pull up Playa or things like that. Yeah. That's awesome. Um, so I'd like to know in, in these types of projects, when we're getting UX and machine learning working together, how can we think about defining and measuring the success of UX work on ML projects? I think that's a great question. I think ultimately it depends. Um, I think, you know, some of it too is like uh, just the product success overall. Um, that's a big one. I mean, yes, marketing and every, there's a bunch of other teams. Product management is also involved. Oh yeah. Also, I work a ton with product managers. I'm leaving them out of this equation, but they're equally important for all this stuff too. Um, but some of it might also be like maybe you think critically about how you measure en engagement. It's not just mm -hmm. like hours watched or anything like that too. Maybe you think like, well, what is a good engagement? Maybe if it is 
are you driving purchasing? Are you driving sharing or that kind of thing too, instead of like mindless hours scrolling or things like that, right? Yeah. Um, so that could be one is literally changing the metrics of how you measure things. And, and one example there I think is Facebook, when they recognize that engagement maybe isn't the best thing to think about, they altered it to, and this once again, maybe some form of marketing as well, but uh, time well spent on Facebook. It, but yeah. it's difficult to measure the things that really matter, right? And we, yeah. we're constantly measuring proxies for what we actually want, right? So yeah. being aware of that. Totally. And the other one that I, I strongly recommend for quantitative teams uh, is to kind of think about the heart framework. Are you familiar with it? I'm not. Because I put it in uh, Slack. Great. So it's happiness, engagement, adoption, retention, and task success. Great. So that spells out heart. Um, and you really think about what are your goals uh, for happiness and their examples like for users to feel like the site is unique and what are signals to showcase that they're happy about that? Well, a satisfactory rating from a survey and like now how do you think about the metrics? I think it's a fantastic exercise to do with teams. I will run this with teams and everything too when we're building out potentially a new product around like mm what how do we actually think about what to measure so take a look at that fantastic thank you for sharing that um yeah. so by, the way, by carrie rodden who made the sunburst uh charts and everything too i'm a huge fan of carrie oh sunburst. awesome yeah um so there are other aspects of machine learning that I, that i think are becoming increasingly important people are becoming increasingly interested in so i'm just wondering how, how ux design relates to these other aspects such as usability explainability which we touched on briefly. We've had conversations around ethics and, 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 and impact and, and, and these types of things. So how can we think about UX in, in this kind of more holistic space? Totally. I mean, one of the things that I like to think of is like, if we treat ethics or explainability as like someone else's job then it's like a oh that's not me it's like basically like what we saw with like chief privacy officers and privacy teams and stuff it's like oh well the privacy team will check that it's mm. private, whatever it's a compliance check but really we should be like good design thinks about explainability usability ethics from the beginning and so really when we are designing these tools when we are thinking about our users what do they want? What would be something that they would be comfortable with? How would they want to be communicated to and everything as well? Um, mm. UX copywriting is another big thing, especially when it comes into um, privacy. That was a great one. Um, so uh, thinking about that from the beginning rather than post hoc of like, okay, and now we have a model, let's just ship it. And it's like, well, wait, hold on. Absolutely. How about you include your UX team in the beginning so we could talk about like one of the things that I work through with ML teams is um, before you even build the model, let me understand what it is you're trying to do. Like, what are the inputs and what are the outputs? So that way I can understand, does this meet users' expectations that they would have to give up input type data of like their location or like their last search history? I don't know. I'm just making this up of like metrics and inputs. <coughs> These are great um, examples. Well, but so think about what are they comfortable with uh, around the inputs and think about how you're going to filter that as the outputs and any of the things that you want to explain around that. So bringing your UX team, even before the model is built, so that way you can have them have a conversation with you about like, wait, how can we potentially, like, maybe there's another way to get at this that isn't their exact location. It could be something that's like, hey, because you searched for playas or beaches, we are now recommending X or something, right? That could like, yeah. you're getting into like a much more explainable, understandable reason why the ML model is making recommendations rather than just default of great privacy, please, or give me your data, <laughs> right? Mm. So. Absolutely, I, I love that answer. And I do think um, distributed ownership over all of these types of things and accountability is incredibly important in organizations. I've actually just shared, um, an academic article by uh, a friend of mine, I want to state, make that clear, that it is a, a friend of mine, Manny Moss, Emmanuel Moss, that he wrote with Dana Boyd and, and Jacob Metcalf about owning ethics. And it's called Corporate Logic, Silicon Valley in the Institutionalization of Ethics. And what they do is they spend a lot of time on the ground um, with ethics owners in Silicon Valley um, in institutions. And part of part of the questions I asked is what happens if you have individuals and individual units that have ownership over ethics um, and how that how that propagates across an org and what what doesn't happen, whether ethical um, frameworks can be built when you don't have distributed ownership. Um, yeah. And it's 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 fascinating work. It's not um, it doesn't leave me entirely optimistic um, uh, as uh, just just the 
Um, this reminds me, so Hugo and I were chatting uh, a little bit earlier before the call, but this reminds me of the other article that I was telling you about, winners artifacts have politics. I didn't get into explaining it, but I'll explain it now. Great. Uh, so basically, uh, this author, Winner, uh, wrote about um, how the bridges in New York leading out to the Long Island beaches, I don't know why, it's summertime, I'm talking a lot about beaches, mm. um, but they, the bridges were intentionally built too low for city buses to be able to pass under them to go this to was the beach. This was Robert Moses, who... Oh, really? Oh, yeah, okay. he did a lot, a lot of damage yeah, in, the in, in, in the city. And it was, Jane, it was him versus Jane Jacobs in a lot of ways, right? And she was yeah. lobbying for... Um, yeah, but it meant um, underrepresented groups such as African American populations couldn't get to the beaches, right? Yeah, or just anyone who uses a city bus who doesn't have a private car, right? Yep. Um, so Could I. Could you provide the link? Pardon? Could you provide the link to it? Oh, or... I did. I did okay. in Slack. Great. Oh. I'll, I'll share it in YouTube. Great. Here, here it is. Um, so uh, an old tweet, but a good tweet uh, from me in 2019. Uh, because I just want everyone to think critically about all of us have a part to play in these tools and products that we make. And so when you design a machine learning algorithm, machine learning product that just like gives an answer, think about like, well, wait, how could someone contest this? What, it, what might they do with this? Like, right. By not allowing them to engage or have control or mm anything like that too you're just kind of taking away their autonomy and just being like this is you're further perpetuating like oh it's a black box and like oh you there's no control over this and like the algorithm is objective it used math the math is objective you know all this stuff too but actually there's all these other things that go into it as well and it's all of our responsibility to think critically about like wait hold on how can i make sure the guardrails are clear or how can i make sure like this model should only be used in X case or Y case or things yeah. like that. Yep, exactly. And in particular, I've actually just searched in this document for Robert Moses because he, I'm not going to speak to, I have particular opinions about the disastrous human he, he was in a lot of ways, but yes. um, I will read. It turns out, however, that the two, this was by design, that the 200 or so low hanging overpasses on Long Island were deliberately designed to achieve a particular social effect. Robert Moses, the master builder of roads, parks and bridges, Etc. Mm -hmm. had these built um, to specifications that would discourage the presence of buses on, on, on parkways, yep. according to evidence provided by Robert A. Caro in his biography, The Power Broker, um, which is an incredible book. The reasons reflect Moses's social class bias and racial, racial prejudice. Um, I also love that both of us have read about this, but in different ways and directed. Yeah. <laughs> like, I was like, oh, I read like a synthesis by Winner. And I, I really do love this paper by Winner. I think it's like one of the canonical papers that I refer to for AI ethics, because it's just like, we're talking about bridges here, but this can be applied. Like bridges, they're not political, right? Wrong. Mm. Think about how we build things, who gets to be involved, who gets access, and also how we build things for access now. Think about 10 years in the future and everything too. One of the other things that I talk about that I don't think many teams enjoy talking about is like, how are we, before we even build the model, who's going to maintain it? How are we going to depreciate it? That should be conversations that we have up front too, because these models aren't made to last in, in, in perpetuity and everything too, like bridges, exactly. right? Exactly. Yeah. So how yeah. do we think and actually, when thinking about who we're building things for, I actually like, um, I think civil engineering is actually a fascinating example um, because as a civil engineer, it's clear you don't want, what is harm, right? What is harm in a Twitter algorithm where we haven't quite decided yet? We have a sense, what, like if a bridge falls, if people die, if people are hurt, we know that that is what's, what's harmful. And actually, I think it's the Canadian Association of Civil Engineers. They all, um, as part of their association, they all have... Um, some form of ring they wear and the story is i think it's apocryphal but that this ring the original rings of these were made from a bridge that fell down to oh. yeah to make sure that they always keep kept in mind the people they were serving the users oh. right yeah i love it let's yeah. all carry around a little bit of um machine learning to remember who i I, I think that's a, a beautiful suggestion. Michelle, we're out of time, but what I'd love for you to do is let people know a, a call to action, something they can do to learn more about this if it interests them. I think joining the ML UX meetup would be fantastic, but there may be others as well. Totally, come on down. Uh, we host free events normally once a month. 
uh, we I had a busy month this month, so I didn't get to schedule one, <laughs> but uh, come on and join us at MLUX Meetup. I think the best way is following us on Twitter, LinkedIn, um, meetup.com and everything too. Um, check out all of our past videos and everything as well. So we do record these. So if you are interested in learning more, great news. We've been recording them for the last five years. So you can take a look uh, through our YouTube channel. I've tried to group them into like kind of playlists. So if there's like something that speaks to you, like totally go look for it. Um, and then, uh, yeah, I mean, keep tweeting at us if you have any uh, good insights or things that you want to share. Um, and thank you to all the volunteers behind the scenes who help make it possible. I want to acknowledge mm -hmm. that I'm speaking on behalf of all of them, but it's a volunteer led organization. Yeah. And you know, this is something I do in my free time is organize the MLUX meetup. And so uh, thank you to everyone else who helps make it possible because it's cool people like you that help support us. And this is why we're still here. So yeah. Fantastic. Thank you, Michelle. And everyone who joined, we didn't get to all your questions, but we will if you come on to Slack. I'll synthesize a couple of them, but if you want to join in AMA guests and, and, and ask them, that would be fantastic. We look forward to seeing you there. Um, I just want to thank Michelle. And we're getting a lot of thanks coming through on, on the chat as well, which is great. But I want to thank you for your time and expertise and everything you do in this space as well, Michelle. So thank you. Oh my gosh. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Um, and thank you everyone for joining from around the world and uh, know that doing UX on ML or ML for UX, whatever it is, is important. And so there's other people who are interested in this. Come on down. Yeah, exactly. All right. We'll see you next time, everyone, and see you on Slack. All right, ciao. Bye.